So what are power and sample size calculations? These are these things that kind of appear all over the place and I was asked to sort of give a kind of a view and some, some background and so on. Um, right, so what are power calculations? Power calculations are really a method to estimate the chances of detecting the effect you're looking for in an experiment before the study is conducted. There's no role at all for power calculations after the study is conducted, whatever any, any journal referee tries to tell you. Once you've done the study, what you, what, how you designed it, it might be interesting to know how you designed it, but you've, you've done, you've, there's no point in doing any more calculations afterwards. That sounds very simple as a, as a statement, but it's never quite as, as easy as that. Um, because you don't necessarily know what your, what your study is going to be before you do it. And so it's more of a way of informing your, informing your decision for the study you're going to do, the experiment you're going to do, amongst the range of choices that you've got. So I refer to it as a tool for exploring designs rather than a kind of magical, this is the right number. And that's what I'm hoping to convince you today. My, in my more cynical moments, I think it's a very useful device to get you to talk to a statistician before it's too late. Uh, with one of my other hats on, I'm a kind of tame statistician at uh, the uh, MRI down the road. And this box that says, you know, on, 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 on for application forms, ethics forms, or um, protocols, or grant applications, says, you know, how did you get your study size, and what's your... is what brings most people through my door. And since part of my role is to try and improve the quality of research down there, getting them through the door and actually be able to then pull the design apart uh, on the pretense of looking at their sample size is actually um, one of our, the more useful contributions we make, I think. But of course, you don't necessarily need one of us. So why bother? When you're designing an experimental study, if you have too few participants, you might not be able to answer the question that you're asking if you don't have a big enough sample. I will tend to use participants for your, I'm sort of an assumption that you talk about people rather more than is probably appropriate. That's because that's where I work, or nearly all the experiments are done on people. Sometimes if it's not people, then uh, I apologise for that. Uh, On the other hand, if you have too many, then you're wasting everybody's time, or you're costing, costing you more than it needs to to get a reasonable answer. And if it was a clinical trial or some sort of study where you, that might change practice, the people in the wrong arm are still getting the, the experimental treatment, the poorer treatment, for longer, and you could have been giving them the better one. That's the sort of ethical argument, because in practice, things, timelines are such that that's never very really, real, really, um, a major issue. It's more about resource use. Um, and if you have if you have a too too few to a, too few people, too few samples, then of course you've wasted your time. You haven't got the results, and potentially it was a waste of time doing the experiment at all. And more pragmatically, grant awarding bodies, ethics committees, and people like that want to be convinced that you've made a sensible choice. So my take-home message I'll give you now, there's no right answer. It's about making a judgment and being able to convince others that your judgment is reasonable in the circumstances. So you're balancing benefits, the chance to find the answer you want, against the costs, um, financial resources, and so on. And when appropriate, a power calculation can inform the argument and put them on a rational basis rather than that was just something we thought of, or what everybody else does. So, this is what I want to talk about. Uh, why bother? What are they? The textbook answer. And then, what are they about, really? And hopefully I have time for some examples. So the textbook <laughs> bit. Power calculations are all have this sort of, the old-fashioned sort of hypothesis paradigm, decision-making hypothesis paradigm that sort of come from that kind of background where you are doing a, doing a study, doing an experiment to make a decision as to whether to accept this null hypothesis or not. 
So in some ways, that's not always the paradigm we're really working in. Um, but if, if we take that on board or take that to sort of for red for now, when you're doing that hypothesis test, you're accepting a false, uh, a false positive rate. Sometimes you'll find a result that isn't, isn't real. And that's what the 5% significance level that you will often use is, um, is about. So you have this, we accept that 5% of the time, we're going, if there's no, no effect there, we might find one. That's what we mean by 5% significance level. Or if you want to be a bit more modern about it, that's, the, um, that's where your 95% confidence intervals come from. But of course, there's also a false negative rate in any study that you might miss an effect that's really there. Um, in the textbooks and things, that's called a type 2 error. You're getting it wrong when there really isn't. Getting the false positive of type will call a type 1 error. And so if you read anything about it, you get these type 1 and type 2 errors coming up. But it's a false negative rate. It's missing the effect that's really there, that you should have found, or you would like to have found. And when we do hypothesis tests, when we get our, our p-value, our significance level, or the size of our confidence intervals, it depends on how big the effect is, obviously. It depends on how variable everything is. The more variable, um, the more difference there is between your subjects, um, between your samples, the less likely you are to be able to find a difference <coughs> if everything is very variable. It depends, on, of course, on the significance level you choose. It depends on the test that you use and your study design. Um, if you do matched or unmatched, for example. Uh, and it depends on the number of participants, number of samples that you actually have in the analysis, the number completing your study. So that's, what, that's I hope, is familiar. Power is the chance, statistical power is the chance that the real effect will be masked by that inherent variability. And statistical power is how we quantify it. Um, so it's the probability of detecting the effect if it's really there and if it's the size assumed. Just like there's a sort of convention, people like you always use this 5% significance level, which comes from nowhere. It was made up once, and it's in it kind of first person who did a statistical test used 5% and it's stayed ever since. There's no logic to it at all, really, but it kind of works. Most people like to see you having 80 or 90% power, that sort of range, or more than 90%. Sometimes you, you want to be reasonably certain if you've got to put all this money into a study, it's got, you've got a fairly good chance of finding results. And that's a kind of convention. Now, that's not written in blood. It can be very well, if you, if you don't know anything about something, it's very early on in a, in a kind of development of an idea, it could very well be worth doing a study that's much weaker power, that's just got a, but it's got a chance of finding something. Um, you know, a cheap, cheap, nasty study with 50% power might be worth doing. Um, and power is formally 1 minus this probability of um, the type 2, uh, probability of a false negative, if you like. It's, I think the other definition is better. I think it's type 1 and type 2 and alphas and betas are a bit confusing, so I tend to talk about false positives and false, neg false negatives. And, like the slide before, the power of a study depends on the size of effect you're looking for, how variable everything is, the significance level you choose, the statistical test and the design of the study, and the numbers, just like the, like the, the p-value does. And of course, you don't know all these before you undertake the study. You certainly don't know how big the effect is. You probably don't have a very good idea of the variability. Um, you should, should say what your study design is. You can probably make a fairly good guess how many will complete the study. Um, but certainly, some of these things you don't know before you start. So, why not? Before I go too far, I want to say you don't always need to do these. This isn't always, you know, most, not all studies have, are appropriate to use power calculations <coughs> in. 
Um, a lot of studies don't have, aren't about testing a clear hypothesis. If you're trying to measure how many people do, do something, um, descriptive studies, prevalences, diagnostic tests, all sorts of studies that you might want to do don't involve testing a formal hypothesis in that way. Um, there may not be any data at all on any of those things I talk about, effect sizes, variances and so on. Um, so you can't do you can't do a power calculation. In that case, you probably want to do a fairly small study or a pilot study to get some information to let you design the bigger study. Um, and sometimes you have no choice over how many people you use. If you're doing everybody, you're doing everybody. Um, so I would argue it's a waste of time really um, worrying about what your sample size might be if you haven't got any choice over it. But if you're trying to get funding for it, you might still want to justify that you've got, with the, with the population you've got, that it might be worth, you'll get something useful out of it. So maybe that last one is uh, less, is arguable, is debatable. So just because there's a box on the form doesn't mean you have to make something up. If you can't do it, you can't do it. But you do have to say why you've chosen the sampling size you have. And be honest, <laughs> I think is the, you can make things up, but if they're rubbish, somebody will probably spot it. Now, I thought I just ought to show an example of a power curve, just to show you what one, what, what, how power works. Um, so this is a nice simple t-test comparing one group with another group on a nice continuous variable. Um, so it's that deviation of one and we, we've got very small differences here. You get a very, you need very sm small, sorry, large differences compared to the standard deviation. You get a lot, you get lots of power with very small numbers. So this is 100% here, isn't it? Never get to 100%. You never get to 100%, of course, because it suddenly gets closer and closer and closer to it. But as you look for smaller and smaller differences, the power you have to detect those differences goes down. Um, or the sample size you need to detect those differences goes up. Um, notice how flat these curves, you usually talk about wanting 80 or 90% power, see how flat these curves become. A few, a few here and there doesn't make a difference. You're talking about, you know, adding, doubling your sample size, or, you know, you need to, you need to be considering big proportionate increases, not adding one or two to your sample to make any difference. Um, you can also look at that plot very similar curve with a difference call the difference constant and increasing the standard deviation. Now if you increase the standard deviation, increase the variance, the spread in between uh, between the people, the people in your study, um, again the power drops off or you need larger numbers. So small differences make very little difference. And you know, one rule of thumb there is if you halve the effect size you're looking for, so if you're looking for effect size of three millimeters rather than six millimeters, you need four times as many subjects to get the same power. Um, and I said about flat curves. So to compute the power, you need to know the study design and the test you're going to use, the variability in the effect size. So these are things that this should be coming familiar, I hope. Um, the effect size the study is planned to test and the number of participants we're going to have. So I've got a slide on each of those, I think, in a moment. And the textbook version is you identify your endpoint, you identify your main comparison, you estimate your variance, you decide on the effect size you want to detect, decide on the power you need, you calculate the, the sample size, you can calculate the sample size. I think that's those last two points of, of repeating, aren't they? So what design? Some designs, some studies designs are more efficient than others, um, and some statistical tests are more efficient than others. Particularly if you can use matching in some way, um, paired data, um, before and after, with base, baseline adjustments and so on. 
um, and meta analysis will follow from the design. Um, and there's just a plea that if uh, design is complex, you probably need somebody who, who understands these things. Um, these slides are written. That's not to say appropriate methodologists rather than statistician there. And the crucial bit um, in actually to do any power calculation is estimating the variance, the, the spread between um, the outcomes you're measuring between, between subjects, between participants. You may have pilot data. Uh, you, you, you would hope you would have some pilot data of, of a published studies using similar outcomes in similar populations. Um, can be quite difficult, of course, to find the, the, the actual numbers you need in the papers, um, which is easy if you've got your own data. Um, but they, you, for most people, most things you're doing, you're using measurements that have been done before. and be, they're, they're familiar measurements in familiar sorts of situations, so there probably is some reasonable estimates of what the difference, what the standard deviation between participants is. Um, but you may need to do a pilot study. Um, one thing I'd be aware of is very often you're doing before-after type studies, so your main comparison is actually a difference, not the value itself. Your main thing you're interested in is, how, is the change according to your treatment between baseline and um, when you're measuring things. So what the variance you want is the variance of the difference, not of the individual measurements. And that's often a lot harder to find from papers. People don't tend to publish that. It's, um, and it's usually, of course, less than the variance between just at the, the, the end point itself. Um, and so assuming you can find something, um, the argument is that you should always, the argument on the textbook would say, always say you need to be conservative and test sensitivity to assumptions. In other words, um, you, may, you, they, you may not be as lucky as they were. You might, have a, you, you might have a more variable population, and you should allow for that. The estimates you get from studies of variances, of standard deviations, are, in, are estimates, and they have a net, there is a variance on a variance, if you like. Um, and if you're really in the business of doing strict um, doing sort of tri clinic clinical trials and things with lots of good pilot data and so on. Um, people would say you should, pa you should power on the basis of you know, the 75th, 75% um, sort of confidence interval, the sort of upper limit of that. So you actually allow this, these variants that you've got from the published studies, plus a bit. Um, in general, most studies, you've, you're just desperate to find any old number and the only number you can to get some sort of feel for this. And you, but you tend to say, you'll take the upper estimate, the upper end of the range, rather than the lower end, which will give cause for quite easy to pick a study, or you get less power. What numbers? How many is reasonable, is the obvious question. A first question. Um, it's all right saying doing a power calculator, and it's 5,000 people, if there's only 15 in the world. Um, so we have ethical considerations, time scales, cost, availability, um, and state of knowledge. A small study is much more is justified if nobody's done anything. If there are lots of people done small studies, then there's no point you doing yet another small study. And you probably need to do a much larger one. Um, if you've got some sort of comparison, case control comparison, um, or a randomized study. Sometimes it's easier to get controls than it is to get cases. Um, in which case, you do get more power by putting more of them in. The optimum number is, when it's, uh, in terms of total number in the study, is to have equal allocation. But if some one lot is easier to get than the other, then you might be able to, you, might, you, you get more power by adding more of them. Um, and I always say, think of the number of events if you've got something that's a dichotomous binary outcome, a yes no outcome, um, what drives it is the, num the number of people where, where the thing happens to. 
Um, it's the number of events that drives it, not the total number. So if you've only got one in a hundred people have whatever outcome it is you're looking for, then it's the one that matters, not the hundred. Um, that drives the numbers. And always forget, in any study, you don't actually end up with the same the number at the end that you thought you were going to. So allow for dropouts. Effect size. The smallest effect that you want the study to be able to detect. Nice textbook um, statement. The small, in clinical trials work, they talk about this smallest, the clin smallest clinically relevant difference. Which is usually, if you talk to doctors, they'll say, oh, anything's really, anything's mainly not that is. Um, or the smallest amount that would make you change practice or make you change policy. Um, so that's at one end. And ideally, you'd like to be able to detect anything that would make you change, make any difference to the world at all. Um, the smallest effect that would be in anything biologically. Now, you can't, you may not be able to do that study. Um, but you also need to think about what's reasonable to expect because um, obviously there's no point doing a study which is only powered to find something that is totally unfeasible. So somewhere between the smallest difference that actually be, may be of any interest and the largest difference, the fe largest feasible effect is probably where you, is, you've got to be somewhere in there otherwise the whole study doesn't make any sense but there's a lot of room for negotiation and um, development as you go through a research programme um, between those. Um, and you, of course, may have different outcomes. It may be earlier stud earlier in a programme, you would use some sort of surrogate, easy to measure outcome that's much more common. And later on, you might want to go for much larger studies with a very hard outcome. Um, And I've said those points already. So in practice, we identify the endpoints, we identify our main comparisons, we identify our variances, our effect sizes, size of power, calculate the sample size, and then you consider the practicalities and negotiate. Because you find the number doesn't make sense or is not practical. Or you could actually do a lot more than that. Um, and you ask the question again, what effect size? Do we want to go up and down this scale? Um, would we be happier with, a, with less power? Or do we really want a bit more? Um, could we actually do something with different designs or a different end point? Um, do we actually want to look at subgroups and not the whole? So you want power to look at certain subgroups as well. Um, so you consider the alternatives, you think about your assumptions, are those assumptions a bit too generous? Have we been too, are we too, um, making too strong assumptions? And you, you go up and down and you think about it and you play around and you come up to a decision. A decision. Is the design you've got appropriate? Um, given the cost and the number of participants um, and the chance of finding a positive result, of that, of that size, it's a study worth doing. And that's what it's about. Yes, it can be. <laughs> the power calculations um, are what give you the, a, a numerate basis for making these, having these discussions. <coughs> but the assumptions can be, are can be questioned um, and other people will come to different answers and it's up to you to convince people and um, that your answer is reasonable because there's no right answer. The power calculations are wonderfully cal accurate calculations based on approximate numbers that you've, wrote, that you've found from somewhere and dreamt up um, and this, they may very well be wrong. Um, and there may be other studies that you could have done, and it's about the choice. Quickly onto 
things happen about doing these things in practice. Um, for when you're doing calculations, power, power sample size calculations, you, you, I usually end up, 90% of the time, I, it will either be a comparison of two means or a comparison of two proportions. Despite the complexity of the design, it will boil down to this. And certainly in terms of what you've got, prior information you've got, you probably, you very rarely have more prior information than an idea of how big the effect size is and how big the variance, the variance in those effects is likely to be. Um, you very rarely have more information on that. You very rarely have lots of detailed information on confounders, on matching and all these sorts of things. So you end up simplifying it down to saying either two means or two proportions. Um, so two means, that's a student t test. Um, so the question about whether it's paired or unpaired. If you have an effect size, which is the difference between the two groups that you want to detect, how big do you want your, how big do you want your study to, or how small do you want your study to be able to, difference do you want your study to be able to find? Not how, really how small rather than how big, isn't it? Um, and the standard deviation of the measures in the two groups, which you hope to find somewhere in the literature. And if you've got paired, if you've got before and after data, then you might understand deviation of the difference, because that's really what's driving it. Um, if it's very skewed, you might do your power calculation on log data, but and you use have your favourite software, your favourite software to calculate it. Um, you don't worry, to, you don't worry how you do it. You just bring your numbers into the calculator, and I'll show you. So I've got some examples at the end of what, what you can use. Two proportions is essentially a chi-squared test. Um, some software will do efficient exact tests or continuity corrected chi-squared tests or whatever, but they're not very different. And it's not those in practice since very small differences in size make very little difference in practice. Uh, it doesn't really, those sort of details don't matter. And your effect size could either be the two proportions. So if I've got 10% and I want in that group, have this, whatever it is, and I want to see if it's different from the 5% in this other group. Um, or it might be an odds ratio or a relative risk. And the software usually got you some choices about what you want, um, how you want to express your um, effect size. But they're the sort of things you'll be. So I, I usually end up using two proportions. Um, so I think I've said this. Um, I think I've probably got this message across. Um, they're not an exact science. The formula may be accurate, but the data you plug in is fairly sensitive. Um, and it's about providing a rational numerate basis for your decision. How are we doing? Oh, I'm all right. I've got more time for examples. That's good. Um, three sets of three slides, of, three or four slides of pitfalls that people fail to state the assumptions. Um, where you got your, why you've chosen that effect size? You know, you say I've decided to detect a difference of five percent in this rate. Well, why five percent? Why not ten percent? Um, is this a, what you think is reasonable to expect? Is this the minimum that would make you change policy? Um, is it the best you can do with what you've got? Um, your variance, prevalence estimates. Didn't say that, did I? No. For continuous outcomes, your variance estimates, I've talked a lot about variance estimates. The equivalent for a variance estimate, the variance of a, um, for a dichotomous outcome, a yes, no, outcome is the prevalence in that, that's where the variance the variance comes the variance comes into prevalence so that's the, the equivalent measure that you need for the um for the dichotomous outcomes the yes no outcomes and you need to say something about your dropout allowance what you got what you expect to be able to get at the end um I hate these spurious accuracy when it's not really that accurate. I'd rather take a nice round number and calculate the, the power than say to get 90 percent power where I need 996. But that's that's just style, I think, more than anything else. Uh, and if all you can do is do a hundred, then say so and say what you can get for it, and justify it's worth doing anyway. 
it's about kind of bangs for buck, isn't it? It's what you can get out of the study, so the study that you've got. It's what it will do for you. Um, the number work last time is a very often used. Now there is a role for um, convention and you know experience. Uh, and some fields such as you know image analysis, where the analysis is so complicated that you you couldn't possibly do a sensible power calculation. You would say, well, everybody else, you know, similar sorts of studies have used ten patients and they've found useful results from ten patients. So that that some there are some fields where that kind of convention used to be is useful. The so bioinformatics gene you know, genomic type people used to work on that basis with these. You know, these gene chips that used to cost hundreds of pounds per patient. You could never afford to do more than a few. Uh, and they, but nowadays, they've now moved over to finding ways of doing the power calculations. Um, if last time you did the study, it was just significant, that means you've got 50% power if you repeat it with the same number. Because it might be, next time, it might be just a little bit bigger or just a little bit less. So you've only got 50-50 chance of actually detecting it it working next time. So what worked before isn't necessarily a good guide. You need to actually go back and look at the what was the variance, what was the effect size you're looking for. And of course you might that might have been a, a lucky day when you got a really big effect. And you've got to say here's the effect size you got there, what you'd expect to find in future or were you very happy that day. We always use three as a very we've got any biologists in the room. Yeah. <laughs> We always use three, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still do, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> so, not providing any justification um, or inappropriate justification, just inventing a hypothesis in order to power. That's something you see quite a lot of people trying to do. Um, if there isn't one, there isn't one. Uh, power in the wrong design, but that's never, not as in, if you've got something quite close to design, you've probably got reasonable numbers actually. It doesn't look very good in the grant application though. Um, I'm trying to make something up. Um, and be careful, subgroup analysis, beware of subgroup analyses, they get, um, I'm not going to talk about subgroup analyses, I don't want to have time to anything else. So what I hope I've been saying, Oh yes. Um, sample size calculations are about informing the argument. They don't offer a definitive answer. The assumptions are central and need to be clearly stated. And simple calculations and approximations are usually adequate, unless you've got a complex design or a really big study, in which case you probably have a statistician on your team anyway, and you'll dump it on them to sort something out for you. And they'll, of course, come back to you with lots of questions and dump it back onto you. So what I tried to do here was look back on um, slightly caricatured, slightly, probably very caricatured, to be honest, um, from a, uh, discussions in, uh, from a statistical device clinic in the eye hospital to give a feel for how I feel these things work. The first person comes along. He wants to look at low pressure inside the eye. You know, the, the eye test when you blow up low air inside your eye, normally looking for high pressure, but there's also a condition for low pressure apparently, called hypotension as opposed to hypertension. And he was very clear, he wants to compare treatments, two treatments, post-treatment, where are they? Six months after he treated them. Um, and he thinks the clinical significant difference is one millimetre. That's what he makes him make a difference. If you, if you get me a millimetre, if this was one millimetre better, he'd, he would change his drugs he was using. And he's got a really big sign deviation between patients of seven millimeters. So he's found all this for me. And we go and put this into our, my favorite power calculator. And we've got the sample size in this case. Um, we're independent, not paired. 5% significance level, 80% power. Um, difference of one, sign deviation of seven, and this equals five units. That means if you click on these things, it tells you what they are. This is huge. Um, and they came up with 770. But we only see two patients a week. Ah, right. Um, this is the rest of your life. <laughs> so 
So, he went away and came back next week. These patients are actually stable. Um, it's a chronic condition. Patients are actually stable. So could we do a before and after study? Could we do a crossover study? Before, treat them with one drug first and then treat them with the other drug and see, compare what, the same patients on the same drugs, on the different two drugs. Same parameters. Um, same that, but of course, because you're looking at differences, the standard deviation is smaller because you take out some of the individual variation. You're looking at variation within a patient rather than between patients. You can put those in now and can say it's paired. Um, same numbers down here, slightly slow standard deviation. It now comes out at about 200. Yeah. E test, you can say that, yeah. Mm, that sounds more reasonable. So that would be two years if you recruited all the patients. Are you sure? Uh, and you're sure you can recruit all the patients? Hmm. Maybe you've not, this is the first study in the area. Nobody knows, you don't know anything about it. Maybe this one millimetre was a bit, you're looking for really small differences. Maybe if you could find out if there are big differences or not first, would be a more sensible thing to do. Maybe. So you now put two in, and we come up with a sample size of 51, which sounds much more sensible for the sort of study he was doing at that stage in the research process where not much was known, and he wanted to know, get some, some feel for which was the best treatment. And even though you're looking for perhaps a bigger effect than is the ideal, the, there's always the option of combining studies in some sort of meta-analysis later on. If there are sort of seven or eight people doing single centre studies like this, you can be able to combine them in some sort of meta-analysis and get a more accurate answer further down the line. So this study would be useful. It's got a good enough, good enough It'll find a big effect, and if the effects are smaller, there's a potential down the line for people to put several of these together. So that was a reasonable compromise. Number two, a dichotomous outcome, a yes or no outcome. We're looking at two different lens implants for cataracts. The standard, he said, you've got a 5% complication rate, which means you have to reoperate. Um, not very good, I think they're better than that these days. Um, and he'd use a new one, these new rods, more expensive ones, if you could halve that rate, he said. That bit takes a long time. That, that slide calls us about probably about half an hour's discussion to actually get that out of him. <laughs> so now we've got that couple of this outcome. Uh, what's that sample size here? Not paired. This bit is about saying how you want to, I want the perspective on those two proportions. I want to, I want to give the proportions, not odds ratios or... Um, so 5% to give us, I've gone for 80% 80 power here. Um, so compared to the rate of 5% with 2.5%. And it came out as about 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> as you know, the point being, we've had 5% complications, even on the 1,000, you've only got 50 events. The real number driving this is 50, not the 1,000. There's quite a, not many things going on um, to put the, to the handle on these, on these on difference. So can we look at a more common endpoint, maybe, uh, or look over a longer period of time, rather than just an immediate complication, look for longer-term complications? Something more of a sort of surrogate outcome approach, maybe that would be more sensible for what you want to do now. And... There's a kind of infection which clears up, which is a precursor to these complications. So maybe we could look at the precursor events. And they, we came with a figure of 20%, say. Um, so let's say a 20% incidence rather than a 5%. Five, 5 and we'll, again, we'll halve it. We'll go from 20, halve it to 20 to half. We now come up with a more sensible sample size for his particular purpose. Now you probably may, you probably at some stage will want to do that thousand patient study, but that would be involve getting seven or eight hospitals together, doing all the patients in the northwest or something. So you would need some evidence that this was a reasonable thing to do from a single centre study before you could do the big study. 
So maybe looking at the Summerger's outcome first, showing that there is a potential there, will give you the justification to go and do the bigger study. Um, this is what. So that'll be about 500 overall out of the dropout. Um, that is what people often say. <laughs> A small, an underpowered study is not a pilot, it's an underpowered study. A pilot is something that you do in order to get information. Um, okay, we'll forget that. <laughs> Let's be more sensible. If you go to another centre, you might be able to get that sort of number in a 12 months, and then 12 months, you might, you know, that's all, might be feasible, might have to, might have to go to two centre, not multi-centre, but we, it's doable with the contacts we've got in the, in the present state of knowledge. Um, we need to, obviously, I was very sceptical about those numbers, um, which you would be. Um, so, that's my philosophy. I've been not giving you any formulas, because there are lots of calculators, you don't need to know the formulas. I've talked about what you need to put in them, into those formulas. This is my favourite at the moment, this thing called PS, which is a free download. Um, Stats Direct, which is on some of the servers and the university, does some of the common stuff. R and Stata have got functions in there. Um, if they're what you use, Stata's SAMPSI. R is a strange mixture. It's quite difficult to find, out, find the functions, but they are in there if you do the right stuff, if you search around. Um, there's a, there's also commercial software, which is very expensive. And there are websites, and there's a list here, um, that link. Um, these slides will be on, available online, which will have all the links in, won't they? I think the resources are actually on the, will be on the, the web page that goes with it. Um, so that's what, how you do them. If it's not simple, you can talk to your local friendly statistician. Thank you.